you all for joining us today for our fourth webinar in an eight-part series for the Berkeley Master Plan. My name is Erin Schluto, and I'm the Community Development Director with the City of Berkeley. With me today is Ben Carlisle, Principal Planner, Megan Mason Minock, Planner, and Chris Nordstrom, Landscape Architect from Carlisle Wartman Associates. As you may know, we are updating the Berkeley Master Plan from its current vision, version, which was adopted in 2007. Now, a lot has changed in Berkeley and the world since then, so it's important to keep that guiding planning document current and reflective of the needs and goals of the community. One of the most important components of updating a master plan document is getting community member feedback. That includes business owners, property owners, residents, etc. Prior to the global pandemic, we began a robust and extensive community engagement strategy to get the thoughts and opinions of Berkeley residents. This included visits to all city boards and commissions, PTA groups, moms and dads clubs, visits to Berkeley High School and Oxford Towers, and setting up booths and activities at the many community events throughout the summer, Berkeley Days, Cruise Fest, and more. Unfortunately, those engagement activities had to be canceled, but we did not want to stop the forward momentum and the wonderful feedback we were receiving from the community. So we had to think outside the box and devise an entirely new engagement strategy. This eight part series will examine a new topic each session. Our first session was an introductory and explored what is a master plan. Last week, we expanded that by discussing the existing conditions of Berkeley. And earlier this week, we had our first substantive discussion, parking. Today, we will be talking about gathering spaces. This webinar session will be led by a four person panel, including myself, Ben, Megan, and Chris. Carla Wortman Associates has been retained to assist the City of Berkeley with updating the master plan and leading these community engagement activities. If you have questions or comments throughout the presentation, you can type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any point during the presentation. Or you can use the raise your hand function after the presentation has concluded and your questions will be directed to one of our panelists. And now without further ado, Megan? Thanks so much, Erin. Um, as we go through, feel, please feel free to put questions in the Q&A box at any time. Um, we're opening today with a quote from, actually, I'm struggling. There we go. Thank you. Uh, we're we're going to open today with a quote from, with, from John Gale, a Danish architect and urban designer famous for creating urban places um, and great places saying cultures and climates are different all over the world, but people are the same. They'll gather in public if you give them a good place to do it. We chose to have a session on gathering places because of what we've heard from the community of Berkeley. Note that there's no place for the community to regularly come together uh, and gather. City Hall is a little too small. The ice rink is gone. If you want to have a wedding reception or another type of get together, some your options are, are pretty limited in Berkeley. But meanwhile, we've heard such pride in festivals and events, many of which, which were canceled this, come, this summer, such as Berkeley Days and Cruise Fest. We've also heard a lot about the community center. Should there be a new one, a renovated one, maintain what there is, et cetera. The master plan can include all types of gathering places, public, private, and semi-private. All of the photographs shown here on this slide are, are gathering spots. Some are public, like the fair, with the public spaces, the planning question goes back to the opening quote, are these good places to gather? Some are private, like the house and the retail building on Woodward. Here the question is, is there room for homes and businesses to host gathering? But most are what we call semi-private, like the church and the restaurants. When privately owned, maintained, while privately owned, maintained, and programmed, these spaces regularly invite the public in, but also impact what's felt and seen from the street, the sidewalk, or adjoining properties. In this case, the, shift, the question shifts to, are the outdoor gathering spaces assets to the city? If you felt like there's not a good place to, have an out, to put an outdoor gathering space, like a town square or park in Berkeley, you're likely feeling the influence of your city's history. As we've discussed in a previous presentation, Berkeley is a 21st century community with a layout that was designed in the 1910s and the 1920s by individual developers during a building boom with different intentions. 
This map shows the city today with the parks and open space shown in green. And it's hard to see a pattern as to why those parks and schools are where they are. And then if you use urban design principles, such as every dwelling unit or house should be within a 10 minute walk of a park, and there should be an open air gathering space at the intersection of the two busiest roads near downtown. Berkeley should have town park, should have parks or a town square at the location shown in bright green on this map. But we know that that ideal has a very low chance of happening and would be controversial since it would involve private property and especially when we look at public opinion. We, as, as many of you know, a survey was open for the month of May um, and we had over, um, over 1,200 responses. And when we look at these initial survey results, and I wanna note that these were downloaded on May 28th, so before the, um, before the survey closed, we, when we had just over 1,000 responses, the data at least hints that any new construction or projects, aside from maybe an outdoor plaza downtown would be controversial. When you look at this graph, note that 10 is the most important and one is the least important. And you can see, except for the outdoor plaza, each choice has a long tail at either end. So over and over 10% fall in the neutral area. While this is only a snapshot of the group that self-selected to take the survey, we can what we can see is that there's really not a lot of consensus here. And then when we asked about programming in gathering spaces, the divide lessened with more consensus on the importance of festivals and programming for children and not market opposition except to rentals for private events. As we move on to different options we could explore in the master plan, please keep these preliminary survey, survey results in mind as initial indications of what the landscape would be like for implementation. Obviously, we'll need to unpack the data more and look for anomalies. And also, we wanna stress that the survey should always be one of many factors in making decisions, not the only factor. So what are some options? Zoning to allow for private gathering spaces is a standard option in the master plan. We could also look to plan for an outdoor plaza downtown that was just as was discussed in the downtown plan or a music pavilion. And we'll show you a little, a, an example a little later from downtown Northville. Another option is to plan and invest in sidewalks, benches, landscaping, or in planning lingo, what we call streetscapes. Or along major streets, you can plan for and build tiny gathering spaces like pocket parks or seating areas. In terms of zoning, you have at least nine different types of land uses allowed in nine different zoning districts now um, that could have private or semi-private gathering places, ranging from restaurants to community centers, to places of worship, to hotels. Simplifying the zoning is an option with three components and something that we could lay the groundwork for in the master plan. Number one, using consistent terms for the same uses. So the zoning uses for the zoning uses different terms for the same things often, or it puts qualifications on them, such as the type of ownership. Also, regulations um, should look at indoor and outdoor uses as appropriate, especially in these uncertain times. Another thing that the could be done in the zoning is to reg and should be done is to regulate to make an asset to the quarter and the neighborhoods any gathering space by looking at parking, screening, noise, location of outdoor seating, et cetera. So when we're looking at these, when we're looking at zoning, what are the things that we should discuss? And what is it, where do these private or semi-private places really work? Greenfields are different from Coolidge and different, and different uses could be warranted. Also, what regulations are needed for these places to be those assets, both to the neighborhood and to the corridor? And again, these could work vary from corridor to corridor or place to place. As we said, creating a downtown outdoor plaza would be difficult, but it can be done. The plaza concepts at Rabina were part of the downtown plan that are shown on the slide. The city did experiment with closing Rabina once and had some mixed results. Um, we would let us know in the Q&A what your thoughts were, or if you're watching this on YouTube, um, please um, use the methods that we have at the end, um, either use the comments there or use the methods at the end to let us know. And we'll give you an email, a telephone, um, a telephone number, and also a Google form uh, where you could, you could let us know comments. Also, the city of Northville created a town square and an established downtown like Berkeley's 
on a lot in the middle of a block and then, then eventually expanded into an event space and you can see the music pavilion in the back. Um, this was part of a plan, but it took years to implement. So in terms of looking at um, and what needs to be discussed is really where do you want to invest? And these type of, making these type of places take time, energy, and money. And another question is what helps Berkeley businesses and the community? And that could influence the location and also the design. And again, we want to know your thoughts on these. Also, the downtown plan showed several concepts for pocket parks and seating areas. And these are images that were in the downtown plan. And one of the things that we would like to know as we go forward is, did you, you know, they were in the plan and so there was a general consensus that it seemed like these were good things to pursue, but in what order? Um, and, and are there things in there that perhaps could be changed in terms of the streetscapes? For instance, on, um, on, on either one, the bike lanes could be changed into outdoor seating areas or expanded into parking or the 15 minute pickup areas. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be everything that's shown in, in these sketches. And so on those streetscapes, it's really what do we plan for and what can be done when standard improvements are made? Um, and so those are things that we need to, as we determine what um, what the community wants, and that goes into the plan. Also, how, how those things are scheduled and when they're done are factors. Finally, we have a couple of concepts um, from the, um, in terms of pocket parks and seating areas. Um, if you like all of them, which was the one that you want to do first and which one would you want to do last? This is the Oddfellows pocket park concept. Um, but there was also this concept for Dorothea, the Dorothea Street Plaza. And really, are these viable? Another thing that um, seemed to have a lot of um, support was a green seating area at Berkeley High School. And maybe this would be a pri higher priority. So as we look to implement or to put some of these things in the plan, we want to ask ourselves, what should, it, what should be on a corridor to make it a great place? Is it one of these pocket parks? Is it the streetscape or a different idea? Or maybe the streets are great as they are and they don't need these type of things. Um, also, what should be sta standard? Um, and you can see in this slide um, that there are street trees that are standard, but also trash cans um, and planting areas. And are those things that should be standard on each corridor and we look to have them and as well as lighting. Um, and again, we want to hear your thoughts on these. Finally, to touch on the community center, this is a line graph of survey data from May 28th, and it shows the level of support for the new community center um, to build a new community center in gray. Um, and then it shows the support to renovate a new community center in the dark blue. Um, in both cases, what we see is this jagged W, which is evidence that there are strong voices on the yes and no sides of the debate. Um, one is least desired, 10 is most desired. Um, and then where there's little consensus in between. And so what this shows at a minimum is that the, what happens with the, with the community center is gonna be a hard conversation. Um, and we're committed to having that conversation as part of the master plan, but also as part of the parks and rec plan, um, which is underway as well right now. We opened with a quote that was a bit like the movie Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. But this graphic from the Project for Public Spaces shares that a great place is not just what is built. It's about social ability, so how people act in the space and when uses and activities, what happens in the space, and how it really needs to be genuine to the community. Comfort and image. So is it clean? Is it safe? Is it a place, pleasing place to be? And access and linkages. Can you get there easily by walking, um, by biking? Can you happen upon it if you're coming from some other place? Um, and is it easy to park there and then access it that way? So, Really, it's not enough just to build a great place, but you need to program it, maintain it, 
keep it keep it safe and make sure people can get there. And great great places are a commitment to an asset. The upcoming schedule shows you a series of more webinars running through June thirtieth. In addition, we're having um, weekly online drop-ins where people can ask any questions they want or responses to other comments or provide additional additional insight. Our next one is tomorrow, Friday, June fifth at four o'clock. Um, these times um, these times and days vary, so please check the berkeleymish.org master plan for the schedule. And finally, as Aaron said in the beginning, we really want you to share your thoughts with us. So listed on the slide are various ways to get in touch with us and give us your thoughts. I want to highlight the comment form at the bottom of the slide. Um, please use it to share our thoughts. If you please use it to share with us any thoughts that you might have. You don't want to share that information publicly, either as um, either in the either live on this webinar today, um, in the comments in YouTube, or um, or via Facebook or whatnot. Um, and with that, we would love to answer any questions and have a discussion. So I see that we have uh, two attendees um, and we don't have any questions in the Q&A yet. Um, again, we really wanted to hear from you on some of these items um, as well as um, as well as any reactions to what was presented. But, come, on. come on, Joe. Joe, I know you had a question there. You feel free to raise your hand, we'll unmute you or type it in the Q&A. Well, Megan, I'm, I'll just get the conversation started and I'm interested. Right. Um, we are obviously in uh, things with the pandemic have significantly kind of changed um, a lot of the way we're thinking. And I, I think we don't know what the result is going to be, but um, what, what do you, what's your feelings or thoughts or has there been any research on how um, the pandemic may impact the centralized gathering space concept? Are, are, are people going to feel comfortable coming to a centralized place together? I think that will, um, that's kind of a wait and see. Um, but also these shared spaces are becoming more and more important to your local businesses for them to be able to use them um, for, um, to have expanded essentially floor area for restaurants or for, um, or, or for their retail. So there's many, many Michigan communities right now, which have, um, before the pandemic loosened um, their regulations on um, outdoor seating for restaurants and parks, um, sidewalk and sidewalks and streets, um, and so um, plazas of those natures um, will, I think, are going to be used for those. Um, also, opportunities for maybe retail areas in your downtown to have a sidewalk sale um, or whatnot, or to have a place where people can sell their goods in public, but it's open air, so it's safer. Um, and so I think we'll see those public places used um, in different creative ways in order to maintain social distancing and public health. Yeah, you, um, you want to talk a little bit about um, what Ann Arbor's done about kind of lifting some of the uh, alcohol restrictions and how that may lead to, to a kind of a centralized plaza where people gather to... Right. Yeah, Ann Arbor's looked into it. I think also City of Northville is as well and many other... Um, communities across Michigan are, and I know that there's also something, um, a piece of legislation that's moving through the, um, the state legislature um, to essentially create, um, so kind of an open air district, um, and you might use it as, you might use a public event um, application to do it, to open your streets and to say, our sidewalks and certain streets are shut down um, Friday nights, Saturday afternoons, and Saturday afternoons and evenings, and then Sunday Sunday evenings, to give those restaurants and those retail areas opportunities to expand their floor area and have an open air because they're limited to fifty percent of their capacity right now. Um, also, in terms of alcohol sales, they're looking at um, having um, what are called social districts, and the best example probably is the French Quarter in New Orleans. Um, in that 
then they have regulations where any bar or restaurant or tavern could that sells alcohol, as long as they put it in a plastic cup with a lid that has the name of the restaurant on it, then people could circulate. And let's say for a public square, you have a restaurant that's not on one of the streets that closed, is closed off, then you could give them equal opportunity to set up a stand there or a food truck or something of that nature um, in those public areas. Um, so I think that everybody's trying to be creative right now to um, do the best by their businesses um, and give them opportunities um, to, um, to have as close to possible as, as daily business as they could. Um, and we have a couple of uh, questions, but just last thought on this, I just wanted to um, what add is I think, and, and I, we should introduce Chris Nordstrom is from um, our office as well, and he's on, he's on uh, obviously on the video chat here, and Chris is a landscape architect and is assisting the, the city of Berkeley in drafting the recreation plan. So Chris has a lot of experience and can lend a lot of um, expertise to this subject. Um, but the only thing I thought I, I wanted to add to is that as part of this discussion, as part of the recreation plan, um, there there should be, and I think there is some some thought about how we have multiple purposes for shared space. So it may be a street during the day, but it, you know, on Friday nights it might shut down and be a plaza for this open air special district. So um, we're, we're we're kind of uh, thinking creatively in terms of how we can use multiple purposes for for, for individual spaces. Yeah, and I would, I would say along that line, um, as we're looking at Merchants Oxford, Oxford Park, for example, which is being completely redone, I think construction is supposed to start later this summer, uh, so that it's going to be open up in, in, by next summer. Um, they're putting in a splash pad. There, there's going to be open space fields, and the question becomes, does that park become a central gathering spot for for everybody? Um, or is this something that should just remain a park and strictly for 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 play purposes only? Um, you know, does this fit the role that you might see um, up on 12 Mile and Robina? Uh, so these are again, it's it's more questions than saying this is what we're trying to do, uh, because there are so many different alternatives out there, and it's a matter of what does the community want to see in place. Um, you know, should they be completely separate functions or should they work together as one? Yeah, and, and to that thought, Joe, Joe has added, um, uh, you know, a question for, I guess I'm going to ask Megan and Chris, um, you know, can the master plan lay the foundation for a temporary gathering spaces? For example, the recent uh, uh, pedestrian only street types in Ann Arbor and East Lansing. Um, and he believes that MDOT has done this concept in Corktown last year. So it kind of gets back to the part about the multi-purpose use of a single space like a street. Absolutely, the master plan can lay groundwork for temporary uses um, and can call out also what those temporary uses would look like or that we want to do a pilot project and, 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 and try this out. Um, there's lots of different examples called um, technical urbanism or um, quick and dirty um, where you can um, experiment about um, turning a place into a park or closing a street for a small small uh, for a short time and then seeing how that feels and seeing how how you use it and you also have um, events um, which do either use or close down streets um, already and those might be places where you might look to make some improvements um, let's say if um, you're closing down 12 mile often um, to instead of it being curb and gutter, um make it so that there's lines and bollards that show where the traffic is um and then you kind of bring up that pavement level so it's what's called an event street or a plaza street and then when there's not traffic um it's a bigger area because you don't have people stepping over curbs and things like that and so it's designed not only to be um, a road but if it's closed down to be an event space um, but often what happens is those temporary uses or those temporary, the, those temporary event spaces, those are the ways that you see whether something works and whether it's worthwhile to invest in the long term. I don't know, Chris, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I, along those same lines as what you're describing with raising the pavement or having it all at one level, uh, you could also think about things like 
do you use special pavers in that location? Something that really designates that this is a unique area where you're, there's going to be more pedestrian activity, um, where it, but it's still something that can be used for vehicular traffic as well. Um, there's been a, that, that the gentleman that Megan highlighted at the start of this in, in Denmark, uh, they use that quite frequently there where you can walk through a plaza um, and you see people milling about everywhere and yet cars are going through and, and the drivers know to go a little bit slower. Um, so it, it actually functions both to help define that, that event space but also as a, a traffic calming for just your general day-to-day -day activities, which is really something that a, a lot of communities are looking for as well. Yeah. Chris, do you have any examples of um, this Plaza Street concept done in Michigan or even in the Midwest or Festival Street? I think I think it's called. There, I'm trying to remember the name of the city in Iowa. Um, I know they did something like that um, within the past ten years. Um, I don't know of anything. There's Is one. You, there's sorry, one in Ypsilanti on Eastern Michigan's campus. Okay. Um, and so it, it's kind of hidden away, but when they have events, they use that. Um, another example is Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and so it, it, it's a major street. It moves a lot of traffic. Um, but then when they do close it down, um, again, they use special pavers, striping, and bollards. Um, and um, they've hosted things like um, they routinely um, host, you know, the Iron Man um, and other events there. Um, and so you can have a large gathering with lots of people and milling about um, and with lots of activity. But then, um, you know, six hours later, when it's all closed down, it's a it's it's a it's a three to five lane street that functions like that. I was going to say, I believe that, and I, I may have this incorrect, and I apologize for not knowing it off the top of my head, but I think it's Owasso, um, so a bit west of here. They've got a small downtown, uh, you know, old downtown, you know, from the early 1900s, and they took the central uh, intersection and raised that up by, you know, four or five inches, and again, it's, it's got a nice brick paver appearance to it, so as you're driving through, you're, you're slowing down you're, just because of the, the, the bump in the pavement itself, it slows you down. Um, but then you see these visual cues that really indicate that this is the heart of the city and they use it for festivals throughout the year. Um, it, it's been very effective. Uh, my, my parents live about a half hour from there and I know that they go out there every summer uh, for different festivals that are going on. We had a new comment from Joe. Has there been given any thought to boulevarded residential streets being used for gathering spaces, pocket parks, et cetera? I know that in the last recreation plan, uh, there was talk about closing off the end of one of the streets um, and putting in a pocket park and then, and it was met with some resistance at the time. Um, the city is actively looking at in various spaces around, uh, especially on the north and east side of the city, which right now is a little bit underserved for recreation purposes. Um, there are some locations that it could be interesting. And, and again, this is something where we would love to get your feedback. And if you have suggestions for areas where that might work, it's something that the city could definitely look at. Yeah, I think um, Joe has a great, a great question and comment. And um, the best example I can think, it's, it's been done in a lot of places. The best example that I can think of is actually in, in New Orleans, where they actually have, um, they have the streetcar system actually running through a lot of these boulevards. But um, they have these large boulevards where um, I've seen pocket parts in them. I've seen little small soccer fields in these boulevards. Um, so yes, it's, it's, a, it's a concept that's been used in a lot of other places and one that I think we could definitely um, consider or explore as part of this process. All right. Well, we talked a lot about um, establishing a downtown gathering area, but what are really the necessary steps to do that? And I know we, some of it we set up in the master plan, 
and the parks and rec plan. Um, but Chris and Ben, do you want to kind of go through what that what that process usually is and how long it usually takes? I'll start on the macro and then Chris can get into the micro because Chris can actually deal with the implementation. So um, it's similar to the question that I, the, 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 the comment I posed in parking. And that was with regards to constructing a new, a new parking lot. Um, we are not creating new land in Berkeley. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an allocation of resources. So if this is a high priority of the community, we need to find and allocate where we can essentially build this. Um, if, if it's more of the concept of shared spaces, such as a street converting to open area, that's one thing. But if we actually have to um, create it outside of the street, it, take, it requires resources such as obtaining property um, and funding sources. So it really needs to be a community conversation about are these where we want to allocate resources with regards to both land as well as capital costs. So that's the big picture discussion. Once those are kind of answered, the filling in of that space can be can can happen as part of a community conversation. But the first question that, that needs to be answered by the community is, um, how how important is this? Where do we do it? Um, and then how do we obtain the required capital to to put this in place? So I, I'll I'll leave it there with Chris. Once we've answered those questions, Chris, how do we actually implement that plan? And how long would it take to actually build? So depending on on the the type of gathering space you're talking about, there's a lot of different grant opportunities out there. And what you need to do is demonstrate to these various uh, financial organizations that developing a park or a, a gathering space is something that the community is really interested in. So getting the information that we're getting today uh, that we'll be getting later on this summer through the recreation plan is, is really critical to be able to demonstrate that yes, the interest is there and this is something that um, will be taken care of in perpetuity. Um, my, my expertise is working with parks, obviously. Um, so with, within the, uh, the state of Michigan, there are three different grant programs that are routinely used. Um, the Michigan Nat Natural Resources Trust Fund, the Recreation Passport Fund, um, and the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And, each of those requires that you have a recreation plan in place um, and that you are indicating in that plan that this particular project is something that they want to pursue. Um, it can be general enough to say that if you had in there, for example, that the city recognizes that there's a lack of gathering space and we want to implement pocket parks without specifically saying there's going to be a pocket park right here, for example, that would be enough to get you the funding you need to move forward. Um, but really, as far as what is needed to implement it, you know, there's a lot of, of different factors that you have to take into consideration. Um, you know, there's a social equity factor. So I mentioned earlier that uh, the north and eastern side of the city is underserved. So when you look at properties for future development, that probably would be one area that we'd want to focus on. But Again, it, it, it's going to depend on what the, the community says. If, if everybody comes in and says, it's not so much that we need small parks up on, on the, the periphery of the city, but we need something big um, right in the, in the heart of the city, then that becomes a different conversation. And the only way that the, the recreation department and the city itself can go forward and, and develop these types of uh, programs and, and spaces um, is to hear from community members. Uh, so this, that's why we're, we're having the meeting that we are today. So, Chris, I have a question about the grant program. Um, is it, is it um, one is, can you use the, the eligible funds out there? Can it be for a, let's say a downtown park? I mean, with street, with streetscape and hardscape, or does it have to be actually physically a, what we what we normally think of as a park? Um, yes, it can. So I, in East Point, Michigan, for example, excuse me, it was Roseville is currently in the process of developing a, a pocket park in their downtown area. Um, and so they're, I believe, looking at Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund funding for that. The, the stipulation that the DNR has for that money is that it's something that is used for public good, 
um, that it be available without fees. So in other words, you're not going to charge people to come in and use this, this space. Um, it, they prefer it to be, to have a recreation component to it, um, but it, 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 there's still some wiggle room there. So they do a lot of work with trails, for example, and so bike lanes might be something that would qualify. Um, if, they, if you didn't go the route of the DNR, you've got funding available through the Michigan Department of Transportation um, and, and several other, it, which you, you folks know even better than I do, uh, several other programs are, that can be used for developing these types of spaces in a, in a downtown setting. Is it, is it, is it to, to go after these grant programs, is it enough to have in the master plan or does it have to be in your officially adopted recreation plan? It should be in both, ideally. Okay. Um, if you, especially if this is going to be, a, I would say if there's any question about whether or not this is strictly a recreation property, um, then I would want to see it in both the master plan and the recreation plan so that you can, as you fill out your application for the grant program, you can say, well, here you can see on pages X and, and Y um, in, in both of these plans that the community has indicated an interest and that's going to strengthen your case. And I think another thing to note on those spaces is that once you have them built, you also need to, you also as a city have a commitment or maybe it's another organization, maybe it's the Downtown Development Authority or um, in other places specifically for pocket parks, it's been things like the Lions Club. Somebody takes um, ownership of maintaining and programming that space. Um, cause without the maintenance and without the, without some sort of programming, whether it just be advertising, um, but especially for something that's downtown, it needs to have events there in order to activate it. Um, and that's part of making it so that this is a place that's memorable. This is a place that people care about. Um, and so if you don't invite people in and have people think, have, have things for people to do, um, it could win all the design awards that there are. And if it's not clean and safe, again, it could win tons, you know, it, it could be lauded by design, but if people don't use it and they don't feel safe there and they don't have good memories of there and they don't have good feelings, um, then that you're not going to have a successful space. Um, and so that's another commitment that you take um, when you look at that. Um, and I think that some part of, um, I think that's been part of, from what I hear from people, a little bit of hesitancy in terms of diving into a new community center or diving into something new is that, you know, can we really, are we, are we committed um, to making those, to making those investments long-term in, in what those spaces would be? Yeah. And going back to the maintenance and safety issue, uh, that's another component of any grant application that you put out there. Um, they will want to see a maintenance plan in place for that property. They're going to want to see what kind of safety issues might be present and, and how you're going to address that. So these are things that whenever you do any kind of a, a large grant application, you know, to give you an idea with Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund, uh, the community is eligible for up to $300,000 for development. Um, they have to also put forth uh, at least 25% match to become eligible for that. Um, but again, that program does require a number of different steps to be taken um, and that you show that this is not just a spur of the moment, hey, we just decided we want to have a pocket park, uh, but that there's a clear need for it and that there's a clear desire for it and that you've gone through and really thought through exactly what is involved in, in developing maintaining and, and using that park on a go forward basis. So any more questions and comments from either Joe or Dennis or anybody else? We spent a lot of time talking about downtown. We haven't talked so much about the, the idea of the community center. I know that's been floated out a number of, of times. Um, Megan, in your opinion, what, what would be the necessary steps to, to bring that, have that discussion again and, and establish, potentially establish a community center somewhere? 
Right. Well, I mean, I, I think you have, so if you just look at that survey data, um, it's, it's kind of the worst shape that you could get, get um, for, um, for consensus. Because consensus would be, you know, it would go high over here. And it's it, actually, it could be worse. It could be a deep U. We've got it. We've got, you know, a, a jagged W. Um, so which, which means we don't have necessarily consensus on either end, either for or against, right? There's, we don't there's, have for or against, and, and, and we kind of need to unpack. But what it also showed is that you have people who are passionate on either end, um, either for or against. And so that means that you're going to need to have those stakeholders have a discussion um, and have some sort of community agreement about what what priorities are and have those agreed upon before you go forward. Um, and because it's exactly what um, Chris was saying is that you need to have that commitment to do it long term. And so, and this is you know to to it's a five to 10 year process to build the communities, build a, build a new building um, and then get it up and running and fully programmed. And so if you don't have consensus or a level of commitment in your community about that, it's gonna be very difficult to go forward. Um, and I think we've, you felt some of those fits and starts um, already. Um, and part of the thing is then to have people to ask the questions, not necessarily what do you want, but it's also under what circumstances could you live with it? So, or what are your fears about this? Um, so, and what are your concerns? Um, and have those two sides um, come together on those. Um, and we were hoping that this session at the beginning of the process could be something that was in person where we could have those folks together and have them work in even gather in small groups and really talk about what those are and see where priorities are and then kind of bring that to city leadership and then they make some decisions about it. Um, but um, so I think this is, you, you're gonna need to have some community consensus about it and you're gonna have to put some active work into that. Once you have that, then you can start on um, looking at, you know, looking at, at funding streams, um, be that millages, or um, be that grants, or be that some combination thereof. Um, and but you know, it's it's hard, and it's also hard to plan during unknowns. Um, and so sometimes in master plans or in parks and rent plans, what we what is done is you have plan A and plan B. Like if these circumstances happen, this is the community's plan. If these circumstances happen, this is the community's plan. Um, this is these are the things that were going on. And it's okay to have those different scenarios either in a master plan um, or in a parks and rec plan. I'm gonna to defer to you, Chris, about whether how much that affects your chances of getting the grant when you have those different scenarios. Um, but um, I think that those are things that, 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 level, that level of consensus um, is something that needs to be there because again, you're looking at something that's five to 10 years. Yeah. I and having consensus certainly does strengthen your application. Uh, if you were to put out a, uh, put in an application and you show that 25% um, is strongly for having a new community center, 25% is strongly against having a new community center, 50% hasn't made up their mind, that's probably not the strongest application that you're gonna have. Um, and I think one of the challenges that the current discussion of a community center has is knowing exactly what that means. I mean, what is a community center? You know, what kind of programming are you going to have in there? Does it mean putting in a, a, an indoor pool, for example, and all of the challenges that having a pool entails, you know, finding lifeguards, um, ongoing maintenance, uh, liability issues, etc. Does it mean that you're going to put in large gyms similar to what's already in place um, that can host conventions or, or, or other events like that? Um, or do you want to have smaller rooms available that can hold, so let's say, 100 people for things like weddings? Which And does that is that something that the city should be taking on? Or is that something that has should be um, handled by private entities? Um, 
how do you address the fact that the current center, while it's ADA compliant, it, it's really on the edge of not being compliant. It's an old building. Um, and if you were to try to bring it up into full compliance, the cost for renovating may uh, be more than it would be to start from scratch. So these are all things that I think need to be defined as the city moves forward. You know, and, and, and again, it's on the residents of the city to let administrators know exactly what it is that you do or do not want to see in a, in a new center or, or the existing center. And once you have that nailed down, um, then moving forward with grant applications uh, becomes much easier uh, and it gives you a, a better chance to put something in that's really appropriate for, for the city itself. Right, and one of the things we haven't touched on um, uh, with the community center is whether it, it whether it has some private revenue generation that supports it, i.e., renting renting rooms, um, things like that, making it a, a, a rentable event space. And sometimes that will be another revenue stream that could impact finances. Um, but often, what happens in these conversations is that um, that you know we. We're asking people to think at a very high level, um, and some people, like especially me, I, I don't I don't like looking at it from a thousand point you know a thousand foot point of view. I'm very process oriented. I want to talk about the steps all the way around, um, and so I kind of want to talk about the tail end as well. But if we talk about the tail end when we haven't decided our beginning parameters or what what it is from a thousand feet, we're we're, we're never going to have a complete conversation. Um, and so part of the challenge is in that building consensus is to ask people to let's look at the big picture. We're going to decide on the big picture and then we can get to the de we can get to the details. You can bring that details into the big picture conversation, but we have to have an agreement that we're not going to settle all these little details when we're just trying to when we're, when we're trying to draw the box. So if you're drawing the box, we don't want to talk about what the wrapping paper is. Um, because we're never going to get off the wrapping paper. Um, and so um, that, you know, my impression of being someone who's just recently come into your community is that people want to talk about the box, the wrapping paper, the ribbon, what's in the box, how we're going to pay for the box, um, and all that. And we really, you know, take a couple of steps about where it is. And then once we have agreement, also make sure we have agreement and that we're not constantly going back and taking bites out of what that agreement was. Um, and so those are important things that to be part part of that conversation and, and it's hard and it's hard for us also right now because this is a very emotional time and you can't have that face to face and really get to know people um, and what their other side of the story is often. So that's one of the challenges for um, for the process right now. So, well, we're approaching 1150, and so we're almost going to have only, um, you know, we're approaching only having 10 minutes left. So are there any other um, questions or things that we wanted to touch on that we haven't addressed yet? We've addressed all my questions, Megan. You addressed all your questions. Okay. <laughs> Well, Mr. Joe, anything else? Not putting on the spot, but uh, any final thoughts or comments? Could be, could be a comment before we before we uh, head out here. Okay. Well, we want to thank everybody for their time, um, and also um, for those folks who view this on YouTube later. Um, please feel free to reach out either we look at the comments. So if you leave any comments there, um, you can email us at, what's the email, Erin? Masterplan at berkeleymish.net. Right, um, and then um, there was the comment form as well. And um, you know, we promise, uh, we promise, we wanna hear from you. And if you value anonymity, we promise to keep that. So, um, well, with that, I'll turn it over to you to Erin to close us out. Yeah, thank you all for attending. Uh, we greatly appreciate your, your questions, your comments, your feedback. 
Um, we have uh, our drop-in um, schedule. Our next drop-in is scheduled for Friday, June 5th at 4 p.m. Um, so if you have any questions about the master plan, the process, public gathering spaces, uh, we'll be here and we'd love to, to chat with you. Um, our next scheduled webinar is uh, regarding stormwater utilities and green infrastructure. And that will be held on June 11th at 6 p.m. So if you are looking for that, uh, the joining information for the, for the Zoom meetings, uh, those are available on the city website. Um, thank you all for coming and have a wonderful Thursday afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.